Uh, today we have, in the, in the first session, we have three talks. Uh, the first one will be given by Professor Benjamin Rogers from Brandeis University, and he'll be talking slightly, slightly changed, but uh, characterizing the dynamic pathways to self-assembly of DNA-coated colloids. Benjamin. Okay. So thank you, uh, thank you for the introduction, and and thank you very much um, for the invitation to speak here. Uh, it's really my privilege to be here and uh, travel halfway around the world to meet new people and to present the the research that we've started doing. Uh, in my group at Brandeis. And so my group is quite young. Uh, I've been at Brandeis now for a little over two years. Um, and so necessarily everything that I'll talk about is kind of preliminary uh, results. And so I've also changed completely the, the title and the subject of my talk uh, to talk about something that's very new and, and I'm quite excited about. So, so what I'm going to talk about today is, is experiments uh, that we have been doing to try to get a handle on uh, the, the dynamics of self-assembly in mixtures of colloidal particles. Okay, so really what I'm gonna to try to talk about is uh, our, our attempts to track essentially the life story of this crystal here, which is formed from roughly micrometer scale colloidal particles uh, from its birth from a, a fluid through its maturation to this kind of bulk faceted crystal that you all see here. Okay, so we're gonna to try to track this uh, in time. So everything that I show you, time is, is supposed to be a meaningful variable. And uh, I, I, will put, I will preface my talk by saying that everything that I'll show you is kind of early findings. Uh, and, and there are some open mysteries that I'd like to, to talk with you all about in kind of the coffee breaks or when there is free time. Okay, so that's, that's my preamble. So, so the motivation for my, my work is, uh, is to try to better understand this process self-assembly, which we have heard a bit about over the course of today. Uh, Right, so self-assembly, uh, for those of you that don't know, is, is a process that describes the kind of autonomous organization of simple components into some kind of ordered structure or device, right? Uh, without human intervention, so that's, that's key. Okay, so, so self-assembly, the, the gist of self-assembly is that you have some, some local rules or local interactions between the components, and it is these local rules or local interactions that essentially dictate both the, the dynamic pathways that lead from that disordered soup of components to the ordered structure, and also the, the structure itself. So everything emerges from information that's encoded uh, at the length scale of the individual particles. Right, so to give you a kind of toy example to have in the back of your minds, consider uh, a random arrangement uh, of a bunch of different components, right? some heterogeneous mixture, many different things, uh, where these things are somehow imbued with information that tells them how to put themselves together into some kind of ordered uh, material or some functional device, okay? So I take these components then and I, I shake them up, right? I put them in a bucket and I shake them such that they can uh, sample different configurations of the parts in an unbiased way, right? And then at the outcome, uh, if I do my experiment correctly, I should get some kind of ordered material or, or functional device, right? In this case, this is a kind of technological marvel of my childhood, which is the Apple 2GS, okay? So this is a, a kind of silly example, but one that's somewhat illustrative, right? You can have in the back of your mind, it shows you how you can go from some disordered arrangement of many different kinds of things into something that might be useful, okay? So why are we interested in studying this process? Well, if you look to, to nature, what you see is that nature has evolved to use self-assembly as one of the dominant manufacturing motifs for making functional materials at the nanometer scale. And so these are just cartoons of a bunch of structures at the scales between a nanometer and say 100 nanometers or so. Uh, and many of these structures are, are made by this process of self-assembly, okay? And so the, the take home message here is that the, the function of many of these materials is intimately related to how they were made and they were made by self-assembly. So examples would be the sort of hard drive of, of, of biology, right? So double-stranded DNA, the thing that that nature has selected to encode your genetic information is an example of self-assembly. Two random coils of single-stranded DNA come together to form this highly structured duplex, and that duplex or double-stranded structure of DNA is essential to how it functions and also to how it replicates. Right? So double-stranded DNA would be one example. Uh, there are many other examples, so sort of responsive containers form from proteins like clathrin cages to cytoskeletal filaments also self-assembled from proteins to even simple organisms, like many single-stranded RNA viruses, 
which are self-assembled from essentially simple mixtures of proteins and nucleic acids. And so you mix together some capsid protein and nucleic acid in a test tube, and they will spontaneously form into an infectious virus particle. And again, the way in which these assemble uh, is essential to how they function, that is how they infect and then replicate within a host. Okay? So, so as, a, as a physicist, right, I'm interested in this problem because I want to understand if there are generic features that tie together these disparate uh, problems related to self-assembly. Right? So can we understand some of the basic rules that govern self-assembly? Uh, and then as an engineer, I'm interested in if we can understand these rules, can we use them as a way to manufacture synthetic material? Right? Again, sort of mimicking what, what uh, nature has brought. Okay. So in my lab, we're an experimental research group primarily, and we work with a, one of the model systems that we work with is essentially a combination of two uh, materials. So one of the ingredients is colloid, so we've heard lots about colloids over the course of today. The colloid is essentially just a bunch of nanometer or micrometer bits of matter dispersed in a fluid. Okay, so that's what a colloid is, and why we like it is that we can synthesize colloids to be remarkably monodisperse and uniform. Right, so this is a video showing a suspension of 1,000 nanometer diameter spheres that were synthesized by chemical methods, and yet they have uh, all exactly the same shape, right? so they're all essentially perfectly spherical, and they all have a diameter that's about 1,000 nanometers plus or minus a few nanometers, so they're incredibly monodispersed. Okay, so they're, and that's since uh, ideal model building blocks for studying self-assembly. So that's one thing that we like about colloids. The other thing that we like about them is that they're large enough that we can image them with an optical microscope so we can watch them as they do interesting things in the lab. Uh, but they're small enough that they can be moved around spontaneously by thermal fluctuations. And so they're essentially a thermal system which gives the particles opportunities to sample different configurations in an unbiased way. That also allows us to use the principles of statistical mechanics to describe what it is that we find in the experiment. Okay, so that's half of the experiment. And the other half of the experiment in this experimental system is to use a molecule directly borrowed from biology, which is double-stranded DNA. Okay, so, so in biology, DNA has been selected to, to store genetic information right, that codes then for the production of proteins that make you operate. Uh, in our experimental system, we want to use DNA's ability to store information, not to encode for genes, uh, but to encode interactions between colloidal particles in this suspension. So we want to use the ability that DNA can store information essentially in the series of nucleotides, A's, T's, C's, and G's. We want to use this information to tell the particles how to put themselves together into some kind of ordered structure. Okay, so uh, the way that we do this is we chemically functionalize the surface of these particles with single-stranded DNA. Right? And you can imagine a thought experiment where we take this duplex of DNA and we peel it apart into its two halves, which are complementary to one another. We take one half of that duplex and we stick it on particle species on the left here. We take the other half of the duplex and we stick it on particle species on the right, right? So these are each single-stranded molecules of DNA. The particles move around in the solution by Brownian motion and sometime randomly they might encounter one another. And if they have complementary sequences, then these molecules can recognize one another and they can link together to form a double helix, which bridges the particles together and induces uh, an effective, attractive interaction the particles. So this is a way to encode interactions that are chemically specific. So if the sequences were not complementary, then the particles would interact uh, purely repulsively. If they are complementary, then they will attract one another in a specific way. Okay? Now in reality, the particles are not coded with only individual molecules of DNA, but they're coded with, say, 10,000, maybe 100,000 uh, molecules of single-stranded DNA. Uh, and this is my best attempt to draw a roughly to scale a diagram of what one of these particles might look like. So the particle is a thousand nanometers across, and each one of these molecules of single-stranded DNA is about 10 nanometers in size. So it's about 1% or so of the particle diameter. And this gives you a rough sense of the coding of the molecules on the surface of the particle, okay? So the fact that the DNA molecules are about 1% of the size of the particles means that the interactions that emerge from hybridization of these molecules is incredibly short range. Right? So we are essentially operating in what some call the sticky sphere limit. Okay, so that's, that's the experimental system. Um, this is a video of this experimental system again. 
right? So now we have uh, two kinds of particles, uh, A and B, which we've colored with different fluorescent dyes, and we're imaging them again uh, in an optical microscope. Here the color just indicates the sequence of the molecule that's grafted to the surface of the particle. So all of the red particles are coded with one sequence, all of the blue particles are coded with a different sequence, and in this case we've designed these sequences so that they're complementary to one another. That makes red stick to blue, but red doesn't stick to red and blue doesn't stick to blue, okay? So in such a system, if we heat it up, one thing you may not recall about DNA is that it's temperature sensitive. So if you take a double helical molecule of DNA and you heat it, it will dissociate into two, three single strands of, uh, of DNA that's due to, to entropy, right? And then if you cool it down, that transition is reversible, the molecules will come back and form the duplex again. So if we heat the same, this system of particles up, all of the bridges that would otherwise link the particles together will dissociate and the particles will adopt a kind of uh, random or a random structure, it's rather dilute, it's reminiscent of something like a fluid. Okay, so you have a fluid phase at high temperature, and if I take this fluid, excuse me, and I cool it down such that the interactions between the particles get stronger, right, the attractive interactions turn on, then these particles can spontaneously assemble, uh, in this case, into a, an ordered solid phase, right, so into a crystal. And here the symmetry of this crystal is uh, dictated uh, by the sequences of DNA grafted to the particles, right? So again, the structure that emerges here comes from uh, information at the level of individual building blocks. Okay, so you can see this is a crystal, right? The particles are arranged on a regular lattice. Uh, you can see not only does it have quite good positional order, but it also has remarkable compositional order, right? So all of the blue particles sort of line up next to one another, all of the red particles line up below that and so forth. And by looking at the spacing between the atoms, um, uh, we can solve or we can, uh, we can in infer what the structure of this crystal is, and this one, I, I believe, is, uh, is isostructural with C64S, okay? So this is the basic idea, right? So the interactions are chemically specific and they depend on the temperature. Yeah, so everything is incredibly charged, negatively charged, so all of the DNA molecules carry one negative charge per nucleotide, and the particles themselves are also negatively charged. So these experiments, everything that I'll show you is, is done at quite high ionic strength to screen electrostatic repulsion between the molecules and also between the particles. So experiments are typically done at say, 500 millimolar uh, monovalent salt sodium chloride. Okay. Correct. Okay, so that's true. So in solution, if you take complementary molecules of DNA and you cool them down, they will form duplex DNA, and if you heat them up, they will melt to form single-stranded DNA, and that happens over a range of temperatures, which is, say, 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, and and the, the temperature at which you get half duplex DNA and half single-stranded DNA depends on the sequence, how many base pairs you have per molecule. So here, the sticky ends are quite short, so the molecules that come together, they only form seven base pairs in the examples that I'm gonna show. So it's quite, so the molecules themselves are longer, but only the last seven bases are complementary. And then uh, the reason, and, and here delta T is much narrower than the 30 degrees that you would find for DNA in solution. It's actually about uh, one degree Celsius. Uh, and the reason it's such a narrow temperature range is that the interactions between these particles are incredibly multivalent. So whereas DNA in solution is two molecules coming together to form a dimer, these particles come together, there are say 100 molecules in the gap between the two of them. You need only two, any pair of these 100 molecules will do to link the particles together, and this multivalency has the effect that it dramatically sharpens the temperature. Uh, it's 65 nucleotides in, in the case here, so that's, that's what sets the range, so that's what gives you this kind of roughly 10 nanometers, 15 nanometers number. And then the last seven nucleotides are complementary. So we can talk more um, about the details of the temperature dependence uh, if you would like. So this gives you a flavor for what happens in this kind of experimental system, right? And so taking advantage of these properties, both the temperature tunability and also the specificity of the interactions, a number of different groups over the last decade have really pioneered uh, using this as a platform for synthetic engineering. Uh, so this is a nice example from Chad Merkin's group from 
eight years ago or so, where they showed that you can, by changing the interactions via the sequence, right, you can direct suspension of, of nanoparticles to form into a variety of different crystal lattices. So here they show seven different crystal lattices in this one figure, where they specify the formation of each of these different lattices by changing the interactions via the sequence. Okay? And so here, the, the black and white images are electron micrographs taken using a transmission electron microscope. Uh, and you can see the particles in white. And then uh, to the left of those TEM images, you see a cartoon of the unit cell that corresponds to the structures that they have formed. So you can see that they can make simple structures like BCC and, and FCC crystals, but they can also make crystals that are much more complicated that have some 20-odd particles in the, in the unit cell. Okay. And so these results were recently recapitulated at the micron scale uh, by David Pine at NYU. Um, and there's other host of, of interesting structures that, that people have made. So on, on one hand, right, the idea that you can use DNA to build materials um, has been realized. Uh, so these are sort of triumphs of molecular engineering showing that you can put information into particles and use that information to encode the structure that forms at the end of a self-assembly experiment. Right? But on the other hand, I told you at the beginning in slide one that self-assembly is a process that takes you from a disordered mixture to this final ordered state, right? And these pictures, I would argue, tell you very little about how that process actually evolves in time. Right? It doesn't tell you the mechanisms, that is, what do the particles do as they order, and it doesn't give you any information about the time scale. So how long do I have to wait uh, in order for a disordered mixture of particles to come together to form these orders? And so that is the question that I would try to like uh, to make some progress on today, right? So what are the, the pathways that lead you from the disordered initial state to this final ordered state? What are the mechanisms? What are the particles doing? And how long does it take? Okay? And I'll try to break this story up into two parts, right? So I want to understand this, this full trajectory that leads me from the fluid to the mature crystal. I'll try to break it up into two parts. The first part is, okay, well, I'd like to learn something about how the solid is first initially, uh, first initially appears from the fluid. Right? So I'd like to know how a crystal is born from a homogeneous fluid phase. Right? So something about this initial nucleation process. So questions that we have been thinking about is, well, is this process, the birth of the crystal from the fluid, is this an activated process? Is there a free energy barrier that separates the fluid from the crystal? Is it a single barrier? How tall is that barrier? And so forth. The second part of the story is once I have born a crystal from the fluid, what are the mechanisms and the rates that it takes to grow from this uh, say, sort of, you know, baby crystal into a mature adult? Right? So what, what are the dynamic processes involved in growth? So questions you might think about is how, how does growth, what are the mechanisms of growth? Is it just, is it some simple reaction or diffusion limited process? Is it something more complicated that depends on the nature of the crystal that you're forming? Okay. And then going forward, I'd like to try to tie all of this together to understand what is the interplay between the dynamics of self-assembly and the structures that come out. So are the structures that come out only those that they minimize some free energy, or do the dynamics play some role in determining maybe the structure that you get at the end of the self-assembly experiment? And even not, how do the details of the crystal affect the mechanisms by which it grows? So that's where we'll try to go in the, in the longer term. I mean, this, this question. Well, so it's certainly known in many cases, but I would argue at least in the, in the case of colloids interacting by this kind of, uh, so where you have attractive, short range attractive interactions um, that are chemically specific, so you can make things like complicated alloys. I don't know that there's an experimental demonstration that says explicitly that nucleation is an activated process. Perhaps none of us will be surprised when we show that it is, uh, but there's still some value in showing uh, via direct uh, experiment that, that it is what you would expect. Okay, so this is our aim, right? Our aim is to characterize the dynamics of nucleation and growth in an experiment using direct observations. And of course, if this were an easy challenge, then people would have done it some time ago, right? But the problem is that nucleation is, is rare and stochastic, so it takes a long time to happen. You don't know where it's going to happen and you don't know when it's going to happen. Right? Growth may be slow, 
And the problem, as I've set it up, is incredibly multi-scale. So we have information at the level of individual molecules, which are, say, nanometers in size, right? And that information cascades up to a structure that's, say, millimeters in size. So there are six orders of magnitude or so in length that we have to consider. And similarly, there are many orders of magnitude in time that might also be relevant. Okay, so there are many challenges, but uh, my PhD student, Alex Hensley, the first PhD student who was brave enough to join a new research lab, uh, is, is up to the challenge. Okay, so this is Alex, and everything that I will show you is work that he's done really over something like the last six months. Uh, so it's quite a triumph, I would say. Okay, so he's half of the solution. The other half of the solution is to use microfluidics to massively parallelize our experiment. Right, so everything I showed you before is I have a sample chamber, and I'm just looking at what happens at one region in that sample chamber. So now what I'm doing is I'm using microfluidics to make hundreds of sample chambers that are all independent that I could image simultaneously. And so let me walk you through this picture, and then I'll show you the kind of data that we get. So this is a picture taken through an optical microscope of a bunch of water droplets. So this is the scale bar, it's 100 microns, so we've zoomed out considerably from the scale of the individual particles. Okay, so each one of these circles is a water droplet, it's not a particle, and it's a water droplet suspended in oil. So it's an emulsion that we make via microfluidics. Now inside of each one of these water droplets, if you were to zoom in here, you would see that the water droplet is filled with a colloidal suspension. It's filled with the same suspension that we were looking at before. So it's filled with a mixture of particles that have DNA coded to their surface, and these DNA sequences are designed to be complementary such that they can drive the particles to assemble, okay? So that's inside of each one of these water droplets. In a field of view, we can view simultaneously something like 500 of these droplets. And the important thing is that they're essentially independent from one another. So there's no transport of material from one droplet to the next. Every droplet has a fixed number of particles inside of it, and there's no exchange of matter, okay? So what we do in this experiment, or what Alex does in this experiment, is he prepares a suspension that looks like this. He heats it up into the fluid region of the phase diagram. And then he quenches it some amount uh, in the temperature space into the region where we expect crystallization to proceed. And then he records a time-lapse video as a system evolves as a function of time. Okay? And you can see by the time scale here, so one second of this video equals 20 minutes of real time, that this process takes a considerable amount of time. Right? So, but he's a very patient guy, and he figured out how to automate this so it runs while he's sleeping. And then he sets it up the next day, and it runs while he's sleeping. Okay, so he heats it up, he cools it down, I press play, and I'll let the video go through once, because it's very beautiful and we can all just sit and look at it. I'll stop talking, and then when it loops back, I'll try to narrate the video and tell you a few things to look for. Okay? So we heat it up, we cool it down, we press play, and this is what we see. Okay, so this, this entire video spans about eight hours of real time. The first thing that you can see when watching the video is very shortly after the video starts, you see the emergence of dark spots in each one of these droplets, okay? So these dark spots that you see in each one of the droplets is a crystal. I'll convince you of that uh, in a second by showing you at higher resolution an image of what these things are. So each one of these dark spots is a crystal. That's one thing that you see. The next thing that you see is that each crystal in each droplet forms at a different time, right? So at early times, you see just a few, and then uh, more and more droplets become populated with crystals as time goes on. So this will look back and you can see. Right, here's one that's just formed. So immediately you see some, but there are none in these drops, for instance. And now there is one here, and now there is one here. Right, now there is one that just formed next door. Right, so every one of these droplets, it's a crystal at a different time. And so this reflects some stochasticity in the dynamics of the production of crystals in the drop. Right. There is a simple reason why they all become centered, so that's a great question. Uh, the reason they become centered is they're slightly density mismatched from the water phase. So as the crystals grow large enough, then they can sediment to the bottom, and they're inside of a spherical container, and so they get centered at the bottom, owing to just minimization of potential energy. 
right? So they get centered over time, the result of this minor density mismatch. So that's another thing that you see. And then the third or fourth thing, I lost count, that you see is that over time, the, as the crystal grows larger and larger and larger, the drop becomes brighter. So here, this is a very mature crystal sitting next to a droplet that hasn't nucleated yet. The droplet here is much brighter than the droplet here. And you can see that there's a correlation between the brightness and the size of the crystal. So this might be some information that we can mine to try to learn about the dynamics of growth. Okay, so I'll show you that in a second. That's right. So if you look very carefully, you will see that some droplets nucleate two, and then they merge to form one over time. Many of them nucleate one, some nucleate two. I'm sure if we look very closely, we'll find some that nucleate three. Um, so there's a distribution of the number of nuclei formed in the droplets, which we may also expect as well. Okay, so we can do some very basic image uh, analysis to try to quantify what's happening here. So here I'll just show you uh, using some algorithm to detect whether or not there is a crystal in a drop, then we'll color the drop red if there is a crystal, and we'll color it blue if there's no crystal. Okay, so right off the bat, you can see we have a false positive, but this is, you know, truth in advertising, right? So there's a false positive. The false positive here comes from the fact that there is a piece of dirt on the sensor of the camera. But this is a camera that we borrowed from somebody else's group, right? So this is not, this is not our problem. Okay, so there's some dirt, so there's a false positive, but there's only one, and there's 500 drops. So we're doing pretty well. Then we can run this as a function of time, and you can see that the system will trans transition from having a majority blue drops to a majority red over time. Right, and you can see that the algorithm does a reasonably good job, right, of doing what your eye could already figure out, which is when is there a crystal in the drop and when is there not. Right, but you can see you start out with a blue field and you end up essentially with a red field where the vast majority of all of the droplets have crystallized, there is a small population of ones that don't crystallize in the time of this experiment. Okay, so now we can look at the system uh, from a kind of holistic perspective, right? So we can analyze the statistics of what we find in these 400 to 500 experiments. And so the first thing that we looked at was the fraction of the drops in this experiment that have not yet crystallized. Okay, so this is the fraction of drops that are uncrystallized as a function of time plotted for the experiment that we just looked at. Okay, so at early times, uh, none of the drops have crystallized, right? Then for some period, there is a lag phase where we don't see much evolution in the system, and then eventually the fraction of drops that un uncrystallized decay. Right? They decay uh, over the course of a couple hours, and then you see that we reach this steady state offset, so some fraction of the drops never crystallize. Okay, so this is still a mystery. So if you have ideas why we have some population of drops that never crystallize, uh, I'd be interested to talk to you about that. The lag, I think we understand, which is just the sensitivity comes from the sensitivity of our detection output. So the crystals have to grow to be large enough for us to be able to see them. Uh, and so this lag time essentially reflects the time it takes to grow to above our detection threat. And that's our interpretation at the moment. But after this lag time, you see that the fraction of the drops that remain uncrystallized decays. Right? and it decays over the course of maybe an hour or so, and you would be tempted, I would be tempted to try to put some curve through this data, right? And the first curve that I would try to put through the data is something like an exponential, right? So this is an exponential, the best exponential that I can draw for my data. We don't have enough statistical power, we don't have enough experimental data to say definitively whether or not this data really decays exponentially, is it bi-exponential or stretched exponential or something? And I, and I won't wade in, into those waters because there are you know, wars sort of fought over whether or not something is a single exponential or bi-exponential. Right? But I'll say it, it, it doesn't look horrible to draw an exponential uh, or, over the data. Right? And, and the reason that we might be tempted to draw an, an exponential is that if, if classical theories of nucleation are relevant for the types of experiments that we're doing, then we would expect to have a free energy barrier between the fluid uh, and the crystal, right, that comes from the competition between surface free energy uh, and bulk free energy, which scale differently on the cluster size, right, the cluster size R. And so if we had a sort of a single uh, transiting an energy barrier process that was governing the dynamics, then we would expect to see an exponential decay in the fraction of uncrystallized drops with a time constant that's related to this barrier height via an exponential, okay? So we, so we can't measure this yet, uh, but I can show you that we have some experimental control, so we have knobs that we 
turn in the experiment that at least change the rate uh, of this exponential decay. So for instance, one experiment that we can do is we can double the concentration of the particles inside of the drop. So we can go from 1% uh, packing fraction to 2% packing fraction, and here we see, right, that the rate at which crystals nucleate uh, increases from having a characteristic time of something like an hour to a characteristic time of something like a half an hour. Okay, so this just shows that we have some experimental knobs. We can tune the rates at which crystals nucleate, and in principle, we can use this information then. We can use this approach, I hope, to start to, or to attempt to, say, measure the, the free energy barrier and see how it depends on the types of crystals that we're making and so forth. But that's for the future. Okay, so the, so the next thing that we can do is we can look at an individual droplet. All right, so this is one droplet out of 500, and I'll play it at the same speed as before. Right, so early on, you see you have a crystal inside of this droplet. Right, as time goes by, this crystal gets larger and larger and larger. You can see as it gets larger, it starts to become an, uh, anisotropic. Right, so it grows at different speeds along different planes. So it grows faster in the long axis than it does in the short axis. And near the end of the video, you see that it also develops points on the tips, right? So it becomes faceted over time, it starts out as something that looks roughly isotropic, becomes anisotropic, and it becomes faceted. So we can learn qualitative things by looking at this kind of data. We can also look at the time lapse, right? And again, this shows the fact that the droplet becomes brighter as the crystal gets larger, right? So as the crystal gets bigger from early times to later times, the droplet it's brighter and we can quantify that. So we can quantify the intensity of the drop as a function of time and we can compare this to a reference intensity which is essentially the intensity transmitted through an empty drop, okay? So this is just a video from the, from the title slide because I think it's quite interesting. Um, but more importantly, we can plot this ratio of uh, the intensity transmitted through the drop relative to a reference intensity as a function of time. Each one of these gray lines shows the results for a different drop and then the black line shows the average of all of the drops together. So you can see that they behave quite similarly, and this shows the average behavior of the intensity. So at early times, the intensity uh, varies uh, rather slowly as a function of temperature. It accelerates as the crystals grow larger and larger and larger, and then it begins to turn over as the crystal uh, moves into a state of coexistence with the fluid that surrounds the crystal. Right, the reason the drop gets brighter is because as the crystal grows larger, it consumes monomers from the solution, so the number density of scatterers goes down, and thus the amount of transmitted light goes up. Right, and so we can quantify that in this way, and then if we, uh, we can develop some simple model for the light the transmission through the drop, so if we assume that light is at most scattered once as it goes through the droplet, then we can extract the concentration of the free monomers as a function of time. Right? essentially by calibrating a, a, an effective scattering cross-section in the path length. Okay, so that allows us to plot then the concentration of monomers as a function of time. So we get this from the transmitted intensity. So here you can see the two data sets that I showed you before, right? If you add twice the number of particles, of course, you should have twice the number of monomers at the initial time. And you can see they both decay over the course of three hours or so uh, before they essentially plateau. Now also, the number of particles in the drop is fixed. And so if we have only a single crystal in each drop, we can, we can infer the crystal size as a function of time from the monomer concentration, right? And then from this, we can compute the growth rate, right? So we have the crystal size as a function of time. We can take the numerical derivative of this to get the growth rate. You see that the growth rate changes as a function of time. Everything is changing as a function of time, though. The monomer concentration is also changing as a function of time, and the crystal size is also changing as a function of time. So these things are all coupled to one another, but we can try to do our best. And the first thing that we did was we just plot the growth rate as a function of the monomer concentration. And if we do that, what we end up with is something that looks like this. So we get a growth law that's kind of peculiar looking, right? So it's non-monotonic. This is the growth rate as a function of the monomer concentration. Now, the reason it looks like this is because all of these variables are coupled to one another. Right? So if you think about our experiment, what happens, our experiment starts at high monomer concentration, right, before any crystal forms. As the experiment proceeds, the monomers get depleted as the crystal grows, and so you essentially move around this envelope going from right to left. Right? So at early times, the growth rate increases quite rapidly. It increases rapidly because as the crystal grows, its capture radius grows. 
So this is due to the growth of the crystal. That's why the growth rate is increasing. And then eventually you go over this maximum because the crystal starts to deplete monomers and then the growth rate starts to go down. Eventually it goes down to zero again. Okay? So that's where this form comes from. So what can we understand about this? So uh, as I said before, I'm an experimentalist. Right? So this is a dangerous thing for even me to do, but I can try to write down some transport equation say, to model the growth in some simple limit. Right? Or at least I should try to. Okay, so the model that we turned to was, let's assume we have a spherical crystal that has a radius r that's in a bath of reactive monomers. Okay, so we have a bath of reactive monomers in, that's, that's in the mixture of a reactive surface of a sphere. Uh, I can solve then the, the steady state uh, concentration uh, profile as a function of r, so the radial coordinate. And at r goes to infinity, you get the bulk concentration, and then this decays to some interfacial concentration, which is the boundary condition that I don't know a priori. But then using this concentration profile, I can calculate the flux of monomers to the crystal surface. Right? And the flux of monomers to the crystal surface looks like this. It depends on the diffusion coefficient of the monomers, it depends on the radius of the crystal, and it depends on the driving force, which is the difference between the bulk concentration and interfacial concentration. So I can write down some growth law. The thing to remember is, again, these things are coupled. So the size of the crystal is coupled to the bulk concentration. If the crystal is bigger, the bulk concentration is necessarily small. Okay? So if I take this equation then, and I look at my data, and I just plug in the numbers that I know, um, something kind of miraculous happens, which is the model essentially lies exactly on the experimental data points. So I have one free parameter. I don't know this interface. But if I plot this, it looks just like my data. You should take this with a grain of salt. I've never, as an experimentalist, had this experience before, where you write down some equation, you plug in the numbers, and it looks like your data, right? Um, and so I'm perfectly open to the possibility that this is a fortuitous agreement. Uh, but even if we shouldn't believe the quantitative match between the experiment and the model, the, the forms look quite similar. And so I'm tempted to conclude that that growth is, seems to be pr primarily limited by just the diffusion limited uh, delivery of, of monomers to the growing crystal surface. Okay, so the last thing I want to show is, is just that, um, yes. Sorry, J is the growth rate. So it's essentially DNDT, the, the rate of change of the number of particles in the crystal. Um, okay, so then if we can zoom in and we can look at the crystals that form, right? So you've been trusting me all along that they're crystals, but we can go to a higher resolution objective and we can observe the crystals, right, that we find. We find only these two facets in this experiment, but we do find two. Um, we can image both the real space, so the, composition, the positional order using bright field, and we can image the compositional order using confocal fluorescence microscopy, and together, all four of these pictures seem to suggest that the crystal that we form is this one. So it's copper gold FCC. So it's an FCC unit cell with this compositional order. This is the 100 plane and this is the 111 plane. Okay, so that's what it seems to be from, from looking at the picture. Uh, but this is a mystery. So why is it copper gold that is formed? The interaction matrix was chosen so that A likes B, A doesn't like A, and B doesn't like B. Naively, I would have expected this to yield uh, cesium chloride, but instead we get copper gold. So this is one mystery. If you have insight into this mystery, uh, I would be uh, happy to, to, to talk to you about it. The other mystery is why do we form these polyhedra? So we always end up with faceted crystals, but why do we get these two? So there's a sort of vast literature to predict what the polyhedron you should get from, say, minimization of surface free energy. And uh, one of those would be the, what's called the Wolf construction, and the Wolf construction predicts that for this crystal structure, you should get a truncated octahedron, something we heard about in the, in the earlier talk, right? And so one of these facets looks kind of like this one, but this is a, co this is a mixture of square and hexagonal faces, and we never find a square facet. So this is a mystery uh, number two, right? So this looks more like uh, the rupee from Legend of Zelda, for those of you that are uh, video game fanatics. Okay, but so taken together, right? Looking, looking over all of this data, we can, we can measure information about nucleation, so how does the crystal spontaneously emerge from a fluid? We can start to get dynamic information about how that crystal then matures and grows into a bulk crystal, right? And then we can begin to correlate that type of dynamic information with the structures that come out at the end of the experiment. Right? And this spans 
both a variety of different length scales and, and also time scales. If we wait a long time, the crystal morphology does not change as far as it has never changed. Um, and so what, what we'd like to do with this experimental system, I'll just leave you with two, two questions, right? One is we can go back to the principal novelty of using DNA to encode the interactions, which is we can change or we can make different interaction matrices, right? Which would deliver us different crystals and then we can see how do these dynamic pathways change as we change the crystal, both the compositional order the density, the coordination number, and so forth. Right, so that's what we're working on now. Um, the other thing that I really would be interested to, to study is, is to, to ask how do, how do these pathways change if you change, uh, if you compare, say, self-assembly at the nanometer scale to self-assembly at, at the micron scale. So if you look at the literature, you will see that there are examples of self-assembly of, say, 10 nanometer diameter particles and one micron diameter particles, both using DNA, and they always yield the same structure. But if you look at the schematic just of the interaction potential, you can see that they're quite different from one another. At the micron scale, you have essentially sticky spheres, and at the nanometer scale, you have a range of attraction that's comparable to the size of the particle. And so although the structures that you find at the end of an experiment look similar, uh, I would say it's an open question as to whether or not the dynamics of the pathways that lead you to these structures are at all similar. And so this is something we hope to characterize with our experiment because we no longer need single particle resolution. We're not tracking individual objects, okay? And so I'm, I'm completely out, out, out of time now, so I would just thank you for your attention. Uh, I should acknowledge funding from the National Science Foundation. Uh, this is my contact information if you'd like to get in touch or see more about what we're doing in my lab, and I'd be happy to take any questions. That you have. How oh, DNA at a large concentration did colloid uh, make what crystal FCC? Very, very uh, dense concentration, they will make only FCC? The dense concentration of particles? Yeah. Uh, I, well, that I don't know. Um, I think it, I guess it may depend. All of these experiments are done at a remarkably low densities. Right? So the packing fractions here are in the order of a percent or so. So, so, so when you are coating this now with this uh, DNA, uh, one green and one red color. So they are coated uniformly like the whole sphere? Yes. Sir. Or are there any directionality coming because of the low concentration in one side and... So uh, as far as we can... So there, we're, there are no direct measurements of the distribution of the molecules on the surface of the particle. But there are many, many indirect measurements. And all of those indirect measurements support the idea that it's essentially a uniform coating of DNA across the particle surface. So I should say that in both cases, all of the molecules on each particle surface are identical, so they all have the same sequence. Uh, and as far as we can tell, the surface coating is uniform, so the interactions should be isotropic. Yes, okay. Yes, sorry. Um, uh, about the kinetics, you, you showed a picture where you analyze whether there's a crystal in the cell or not and then later you did the kinetics, and then you could actually see the growth and, and compute back to what it would be when actually you have something the size of a critical nucleus. Because I guess that what you see is not the size of a critical nucleus. So can you now tell when the actual nucleation event happens and how, much, how long the real lag time is? Yes, so that's, that's, a, that's a great idea. We have, um, we have done this to some extent, but we haven't actually tried to, to analyze the outcome in any in any kind of delicate way. But yes, from the growth, we should be able to project back to the time at which the crystal really was born, and we can compare that to the, to the lag time. I think uh, using round numbers, those, that's gonna work out uh, as you would expect, I think. But whether or not we're gonna be able to see something, is there a real physical lag time beyond the one that comes from our detection limit? That I don't know, yeah. Jimin? Um, I, I may be wrong, but I had heard that a seed is required for any nucleation process. I mean, um, so for the crystal to grow, what we saw, as, uh, as uh, Frankel said, is after the seed has really grown to some extent, what do you think could be the seed? Is it some impurities which we couldn't see, or is it some... 
heterogeneity or is it really uh, the particles somehow any light on this? So I, I don't have any I don't have any direct evidence to support uh, uh, heterogeneous versus homogeneous nucleation mechanism. There are certainly plenty of things that could serve as nucleation site in our experiment. So there's a container. So the container wall could serve as a nucleation site. Um, we do everything that we can to prevent particles from adsorbing to the surface of that container. But if we were unsuccessful, then certainly if we had particles at the interface, those could serve as nucleation sites. We may also have small aggregates of particles in the suspension that could also serve to nucleate. Um, all of these things are possible. We just don't have enough information to see what's going on. Yes, um, um, uh, okay, uh, sort of related to the homogeneous uh, uh, nucleation, but in the context of this DNA-based uh, assembly. So it, it is sort of known, and at least demonstrated in simulation I've done, that you can use, you can, you can capitalize on uh, a variation of uh, strengths of uh, interaction to promote nucleation. So I guess in your, in your experiment you could do something of that sort. You could have uh, uh, various, uh, m more heterogeneous system with the variation of coverage, uh, uh, right, introduced and see how this uh, affects the, the nucleation rate because you have uh, pretty much direct measurement of that. So uh, can you comment, is it feasible? Yes, I think that's a, great, that's a great thing. So we could either try to do that by, through some kind of careful control of the distribution of the number of molecules on the particle surface or maybe by doping slightly stronger binding molecules at different ratios on, on some subset that are in. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so we can play games like this where we try to intentionally introduce heterogeneity into the interactions between the particles and this affects nucleation as well. We haven't done it, but we should certainly do it. Uh, thank you very much for this really amazing uh, talk. So I was wondering if the, um, so you showed that some of the cells never actually produce a nucleus if you use this low concentration, right, of, of particles. So wondering if that perhaps comes from variations in the supersaturation. Do you know, so coming from the variations of densities of, of DNA coated particles in these cells, so some of them yeah. might just take a, you know, a much longer time that you're not able to observe. In the well, I, I can't say that that's not the mechanism. Um, but I, I suspect that it's not that. Um, so the, I think there are something, there are 50,000 and odd particles in every droplet. So I think, you know, variations that come just from a delivery of different numbers of particles to the different drops is probably going to be pretty small. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think it's that, unless there's a malfunction in the experiment. Uh, and sometimes you, so we are actually mixing two streams before we pinch them off to make the droplets. One stream that has salt to screen the electrostatic, and one that has the colloids. And so I suppose there's a there's some probability that you could get a really salt-rich droplet that doesn't have very many particles in it. But then that would look different, right? So the transmitted intensity would be quite high, and we would be able to discriminate those based on transmission. So I don't think it's that either. Um, so I am kind of afraid uh, that it's um, some kind of uncontrolled chemistry that might be taking place uh, in the drop. And so we are in the process of trying different surface chemistry, so different ways of labeling the DNA into the surface of the particle, to see if we get similar behavior. If it's chemistry independent, but, but I don't know. We'll find out. Thank you. Uh, it curve where you go, um, uh, is that uh, growth rate as a function of, so it's marma concentration, right? So I guess it goes to zero at high marma concentration because R goes to zero in your. Correct. But that, that then seems more like a flux than a growth rate. Because the higher the marma concentration, you imagine that the growth rate should go up. So am I getting something wrong here? Sorry, can you say that again? So I would imagine that the higher the marma concentration, the growth rate should go up. Right. So why does it go down? Is that, I, I see that it comes from R going to zero. Yes, that's right. But then that looks like a flux rather than a growth rate. It's not the end 
Um, so I think I, I think if we I think if we work out the dimensions here, I think this is just dn dt. It's the change in the number of particles as a function of time, um, and and it goes to zero here because there's nothing there's nothing there to grow, right? So the crystal is infinitely small. Um, and so the capture radius of that crystal is incredibly small, despite the fact that the monomer concentration is very high. Um, and so it, it looks non-monotonic because of the coupling between the free monomer concentration uh, and the crystal size. That's my understanding, but, but perhaps we should talk more. Um, thank you. It was an amazing talk. So um, I have one quick question. You said you had slightly density mismatched yes. your suspension, right? So uh, does it affect the polyhedral shapes that come out later? Yeah, so that's an interesting uh, question. So we have done a few experiments to mo more closely density match the particles to the solution by adding sucrose to the buffer. And it doesn't seem to change uh, the crystals that we form, so the symmetry of the crystal itself, or the polyhedra that we find. But we see a different, it changes the distribution. So it changes how many rupees we find relative to how many hexagons we find. And so I believe that's just a product of how the things sediment. And so we change how they sediment, so they fall on different faces and different proportions. But the crystals otherwise look the same. So I was hopeful that we were going to get cesium chloride if we density match, because maybe gravity is playing some role in essentially compressing or squeezing the crystal from a, from a non-close pack to a close pack structure. But if we take gravity out of the picture more, we still seem to get the same 